Hello, my name is Darren from HG.tax and today I'm in the airport here in Dubai. I'm in the business class lounge where it's extremely noisy, so I do apologize if you hear just a lot of noise in the background. So in a few hours, I'm supposed to board a flight to Mumbai in India for a meeting that we have. HG.tax is a member of Moore's Roland in the, Moore's Roland in the Asia Pacific, and we have meetings twice per year with our colleagues in the other offices. So in March, earlier this year, we had a meeting in Penang in Malaysia. And now we're going to have a meeting. It's early September. The meeting will be, oh, will be, or would have passed by the time this gets uploaded in Mumbai in India. This is uh, early September 2023. So this morning I was reading about a case with a U.S.-India connection. So it's a, ta a case going on that's supposed to go before the U.S. Supreme Court. It's on Section 965, which is one of the many changes arising from the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Now, this section is about the treatment of deferred foreign income upon transition to the participation exemption system of taxation. So, previous to the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, among the developed nations or developed uh, jurisdictions, the U.S. is a bit strange. So most other jurisdictions, if there is what we call a controlled foreign corps so or subsidiary in another jurisdiction, to some extent you'd be allowed to bring the income once it's taxed in that other jurisdiction. You should bring a tax, you should be able to bring the income as dividends tax free it to, back to the head office or at, la, uh, at a greatly discounted tax rate in any, in any regard. But the U.S. was unique, so it was being fully taxed, normally is fully taxed on uh, repatriation to the head office in the U.S. But anyway, that changed with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. But then we have the section 965. So the Inland Revenue Code 965 requires U.S. shareholders. So there's a specific definition of U.S. shareholders under section 951B to pay this transition tax on the untaxed foreign earnings of certain specified foreign corporations, as if those earnings have been repatriated to the U.S. Now, so this means that certain U.S. shareholders of, CSC, of CFCs or controlled foreign corps, they were required to pay a one-time tax on the money sitting on the CFC's balance sheet as at the end of 2017. Now, I remember when this law came into effect and we had a, a tax talk at the American Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. Business owners were understandably upset, you know. Mm. Many U.S. exposed owners of closely held companies found themselves in an unforeseen situation. For some, the money sitting on the balance sheet was their retirement plan or it had been allocated or earmarked for very specific purposes and then suddenly they're being asked and it was unforeseen, it was unexpected to pay what many saw and, uh, you know, I can understand that point of view as a retroactive tax on phantom income. And retroactive taxes that we see that in more emerging markets where things tend to be a bit more volatile but it's really rare in a developed infrastructure developed economy or developed jurisdiction like the US arguably the most developed jurisdiction on planet earth to implement what could be seen or construed as a retroactive tax a retroactive tax paid on phantom income no less remember this is a tax on unrealized income this is undistributed income, but they're being taxed on it. So what does this have to do with India, where I'm flying to, hopefully in a few hours? So it's a case of Charles G. Moore et al. versus the United States. So they just very quickly, quick summary, the, the facts, the fact pattern is as follows. So, so the Moores, this family, uh, husband and wife, they owned a stake in an agricultural equipment company in India. They held their stake for years and did not receive dividends or income on their investment. However, the, the Moors, because of this transition tax, this 965 transition tax, they had to pay for close to $15,000 in taxes on the earnings attributed to them as shareholders and the company. And remember, they never received anything. So anyway, now the, company, the couple is suing the federal government, uh, arguing for a refund. They want their $15,000 back arguing what they paid this this transition tax this mandatory repatriation tax is actually unconstitutional because what they're trying to argue is that income must be realized 
in order to be taxable under the 16th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So, I mean, this has been before the courts for a while. So in June 2022, the Ninth Circuit affirmed the district court's decision to reject this same challenge. In his decision, the Ninth Circuit said courts had consistently held that other taxes, like the transition tax, are constitutional, and that whether income is realized or not, realized or unrealized, is it's not determinative. However, many practitioners and experts have speculated that a taxpayer favorable ruling by the court could be quite disruptive. Uh, an impact on many taxes beyond just this 965 transition tax. The government has gone on also to warn that the transition tax follows the footsteps of the Sapat F regime, which has been held as constitutional by multiple circuit courts. So essentially, they, I mean, this, this is a, a, a law that dates back probably like to the 50s or 60s, the Sapat F. So it requires... Uh, shareholders in CFCs, again, control foreign corps, to pay pro rata share of income, even if it's not distributed uh, under, you know, I mean, under certain circumstances, you know, when when this, when this code section is, is, is triggered. But anyway, so the point is that they believe, hey, this thing has a precedent. It's not new. Forget about it. Just move on. So they, the Supreme Court agreed to to consider it and the brief uh, it was submitted at the end of august 2023 and the couple is asking the court to reverse the ninth circuit decision so it's helpful to think about what does the 16th amendment to the constitution say the 16th amendment to the u.s constitution says that congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or uh, enumeration. In simple terms, the 16th Amendment essentially grants Congress the power to impose a federal income tax. Well, I know some people argue against that, conspiracy theorists, but it, it does, right? So what the couple is trying to argue is that an income tax can only be imposed on realized income. There must be income. It to be taxed, right? It must be realized income. And if that were the rule, Congress's power to tax would essentially be unlimited. In its amicus brief, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce argues that income, in quotes, has a plain meaning and realization has been the defining event that turns something from an asset holding value to income subject to federal tax under the 16th Amendment. The chamber says that allowing unrealized gains to be taxed would mean companies won't be able to control their realization decisions. So businesses and shareholders can be subject to taxes on anything that, that the government deems income, even increases in value that could later disappear as valuations of markets fluctuates. So the point is that this could potentially open the door to a wealth tax or some other tax on other unrealized asset gains. My name is Darren Joseph from HCJ.tax. So if you're a six, seven, or eight-figure investor, entrepreneur, or business owner who needs a tailor-made solution from a qualified team of professionals, we can help you achieve the international lifestyle, the freedom, and even the tax savings you're looking for. Visit us at htj.tax and live that international life.